there have been various factors that contribute to infertility, some known and unknown. But those that are known, it could be anything from age to lifestyle to endometriosis to damaged fallopian tubes. And that's just the problems facing women. If it's a man, it could be an abnormal production of sperm or just lifestyle or environmental factors. But what if none of those factors actually contributed to the reason why someone can't get pregnant? What if they were missing a very key component in getting pregnant because they were simply born without it? It's a rare condition, but one that affects thousands of women worldwide. It's known as Mayer Rokitansky Kusterhauser, or MRKH in its abbreviation form. And you're about to meet two women who have lived with it all of their lives, Joanne and Julian, who are now ready to share their stories. Let's see what life is like for them. How are you? Good. Welcome home. Thank you. This is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for Caribbean welcoming me to your home. Fancy, You're welcome. Fancy. And who's this? This is my little baby called Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah, Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the adorable. This is his home. That's why he's. You can tell he's very much at home. Yeah. 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 So, Karibu Sana, Thank welcome you. to my kitchen. Thank you. Let me so show much. you around the kitchen Great. and let you know what we're cooking. Yes. <laughs> we are famished. <laughs> <laughs> so, today uh -huh. we're going to have uh, rice. And uh, meat stew, beef nice. stew. Nice. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so we're going to make a bit more. I had prepared a few things, okay. but I hadn't cut them off. No, I hadn't no, chopped them off. Go <laughs> so ahead. Karibu go ahead. Sana, karibu sana. Yes. Your story is so intriguing, Joanne, mm -hmm. because when, when we talk about issues of infertility, a lot of times people may feel, is it my doing? Did I do something that would have led to? And in your case, you know, it's something genetic. You had no control. So, what exactly is MRKH, it is a mouthful, my goodness. <laughs> well, MRKH in full is Maya Rokitansi Kusterhauser syndrome, mm -hmm. but we also know it as malaria anagenesis here in mainly the African countries okay. use malaria anagenesis. So, what happened? Um, I went to hospital for a gyna check. Yeah. Uh, that was about uh, in 2019, so about five years ago, okay. 2014. Yeah. Um, and uh, I told them. Um, doctor well i haven't had my periods for a while uh i haven't actually had my periods at my age mm. so he said well maybe it's not something so big but let's just do an ultrasound mm. he actually thought it was maybe something to do with my weight or my diet but he insisted on the ultrasound so we, had, we finally did the ultrasound the next day i went on thursday afternoon we did the ultrasound on friday morning so when i was at the ultrasound um the first doctor was younger, so she was the one checking the picture on the screen. She said, ah. she was like, okay, like, no. So the moment I saw her face, her face, I just knew something is so going wrong. Something is going wrong. Uh -huh. Something is off. And then she told me, okay, I think your bladder is covering your uterus. So let's do this. Just go relieve yourself a bit, uh -huh. then come back and we'll get scan again, scan again. Yeah. so when i came back i found an older doctor he was maybe in his maybe 60 65 and he just looked at the picture immediately and said yes this is malaria and genesis and he told me okay take your scans go directly to your doctor mm -hmm. and don't stop anywhere just go directly to your doctor so in my head i didn't know what malaria and genesis was right. i just thought it was some sort of cancer i'm going into surgery i just i said okay here we go. Mm. So got to my doctor and the first question he asked me was, are you here with someone? I said, yeah, I'm here with my auntie. She's in the um, reception. I said, just call her. So I said, okay, now here we go. Oh it's getting worse. You know it's the doctor <laughs> says, call someone else. Yeah, you know? it's getting worse yeah. by the minute. So I said, okay. So when my auntie came in, that's when the doctor started um, telling us, well, it's worse than I thought. Um, what she has is something called malaria anagenesis and what this means is basically she was born without her reproductive organs. Basically we can't seem to find her uterus and we can't find her fallopian tubes but you can see almost a remnant of her um, um, ovaries. ovaries. Yeah. yeah. At that moment my auntie, she was seated next to me, she was crying. 
I was just in shock. I, I think for me, I was just, I was blank. I was just, okay, so I took a notebook. I always have a notebook in my bag, and I wrote down the name. And we left the doctor. That's the only thing he said is she will need a lot of counseling. She'll need a lot of support. And this is a lifetime thing. It's not going to end tomorrow or it's forever. So just support her as, as much as you can and just be there for her. And so if we can dial back to that day when you found out what it was mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you have hopes for how what life will turn out for you perhaps a family in the picture at some point, and you hear that you have things that are necessary in ensuring that you have a family and you're able to kind of carry your seed on, mm -hmm. and you can't do that anymore. Um, what was going through your mind when you realized, I can't be a mother? To me, it was, it took me a while. I think I was still in my head. Mm. So it took me a while. I remember it actually got into me one day. I was seated um, taking some tea somewhere in a hotel and I realized, okay, let me take my notebook and try and research on what this doctor said. So that's when I researched Mullerian Genesis. And I remember from that day that I researched, I researched about it, for a few months, I can tell you, I don't know the time. I don't know what happened between I think I was just moving. I was just going. Yeah. It's just, it just broke me because I've always desired to have a daughter. That's one of my things. I've always desired to have a daughter. I've always desired to have a family and just have children in the house playing around, you know, and that has been me since I was a kid. Since I was in primary school, I was, I'm the last one in my home, but you'll find me taking care of other children. Yeah. I was always motherly, always loving. I saw a future that I had planned come down to pieces. I always thought I'd be the mother who goes to work, comes home with sweets, you know. Everything that, the way I used to run to my mom, my kids would run to me. We lived in Nakuru, so I used to run from the house to the gate. I would run all the way and find my mom at the gate. I'd make sure I'd open the gate. So I wanted that, I desired that. And that came down to pieces. Just crash and burn, yes, yeah. literally. So. I kind of learned that it's good to have a plan B because I didn't have a plan B. That was my plan A to Z. Right. Yeah. Oh, that must be Jillian. Let me get her. Hi. Hi. How are you, Julian? I'm fine, thank you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you too. Yeah. Ask you guys. So I, I know you can smell it. the wonderful food. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just kind of waiting for it to be finished. All right. <laughs> yeah. But your story is not so far away mm -hmm. from Joanne's. Yes. When when did you find out? In what stage of MRKH do you have? All right, I found out um, eleven years ago. I was seventeen years then, wow. and um, I did not go necessarily for the checkup for the the productive system. I only went there for my legs because I had aching feet mm -hmm. and legs. So the normal questions, when was your last period? Then I was like, eh, I've never had that. So the doctor was like, you need to have a scan. Yeah. So I went for the scan, and the first scan revealed that my reproductive system was okay. Okay. Yes, and my birth canal was closed from the outside. Mm. So they decided I should go for a surgery. So two days later, I was booked for a surgery, mm -hmm. and uh, I went into the theater. They did the surgery. Mm -hmm. Three days after the surgery, they sent me back for a scan. Mm -hmm. They did the scan, and um, the results say that the reproductive organs were not there. So you don't have anything? Nothing. No ovaries, fallopian tube, uterus? Nothing. Nothing. Yes. So the first surgery you went for, was that was now what? To create um, a vaginal canal? Yes. Wow. So after that, um, the doctor decided I should go back for another scan to confirm that because definitely he was shocked. So I went for the third scan. 
So that scan says that the reproductive organs are not there. Mm. They are nowhere to be found. So that's when I was diagnosed with the marcage. Mm. Mm. But the doctor needed to confirm that to be sure right. that he was diagnosing me with the right condition. So I was sent to Kenyatta for a uh, MRI and uh, that confirmed what the doctor said, that I have a marcage. So once you find out what it is, mm -hmm. and you know, I was just talking to Joanne earlier mm -hmm. about this, you know, um, you have certain expectations of how your life would go based mm -hmm. on your friends, family, mm -hmm. just how women carry out life. And okay. you can't do that anymore. When I was growing up, because we are two girls, I, I, I was telling myself I needed to have two boys. Then I'm like, now it started to come back. Now I'm like, so no child. So the dream of the boys is gone. MLK is my shadow. Yeah, yeah. It is my ghost. There is nothing I can do about it. I cannot change. And there is no cure. Right. Because it is not a sickness. It is not a disease. It's a condition. Which you are born with and you have to live with it. I have to ask you guys mm -hmm. this. In terms of uh, stigma. Mm -hmm. Because of, especially in African society, it's like a, a woman's reproductive uh, ability is everyone's business. Yes. <laughs> you know, everyone wants to find out, you know, if, if you're into marriage, mm -hmm. so, so when are the babies coming? Yes. And once you have one, so when's the other one coming? Yes. Um, so when you're dealing with a situation where I cannot give you anything, you know, mm -hmm. even in terms of your family and parents mm -hmm. wondering, so what's the deal? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that stigma and those kinds of expectations? Um... Society, I believe society is every person apart from me. Mm. And each and every person has their own perspective. And um, I hold no one an explanation. My mother knows my story. She understands my story. So there is so there's no point in time she'll come to me and ask me, Julian, when am I getting a grandchild? My sister understands it. That is my family. The rest, they don't have to understand me. They don't have to understand what I'm going through. Because by the end of the day, when I concentrate so much on the society, I'm the one who is suffering. But I need to be me. I need to understand. People will always talk. Even if I have 10 children, they will always talk. Where is the 11th one? So they will always ask. So it's a matter of just know yourself, just know what MRK entails, what you expect of yourself, not what the society expects of you. I mean, and, and Joanne, you mentioned this earlier in terms of um, when dealing with a medical fraternity, you know, you go to the doctor, you're expecting answers, and at times you know more, because it's so rare, you know more about the condition than the doctor. And, and how frustrating it must be as you're on this quest to find out more about really you, who you are, because this is part of you. How, how do you deal with that? At first it's scary. The first few times you go, you see the doctors, it gets scary. It gets to a point of, okay, so who am I? What's going on? But then you get used to it. I actually enjoy being asked the questions that you want. You know the the shock they have. This is a doctor. You know, yeah. in, in African society, it's like they are so close to God. Yeah, yeah. Already, you know? So when they have yeah. that shock look, I'm like, oh, wait, let me tell you. So I, now I just break it down for them. Now I enjoy and I'm ready to do it anytime, anywhere. But before, it was actually got to a point in my life where I asked myself, so am I a woman? Am I a man? Am I, what am I? Like, so what gender am I? And making peace with MRKH can take years because it's a step at a time. You finish one challenge, you get another one. Finish one, you get another one. I am surrounded by people who have children. They're, they're my age maybe, or even if they're older, not more than five. They have children, they're on their second child, they're on their third. Whenever you have meetings, you hear them talk about their families, and you just learn to be quiet and move on and say congratulations and wish them all the best. Because they, you can't give advice. The first thing they ask you, you've never even carried a child, so what do you know? 
and people can be malicious. What, what's some of the probably more nasty things you've heard from people? You know, in terms of them, and a lot of times it's ignorance comes from ignorance. You know, a lot for me. I don't think I've had the worst yet, but I've had. Let's hope uh, that we you know, <laughs> not going to get worse. Yeah. <laughs> Or maybe it's the way I view things. I don't know. Maybe somebody else would say it. Um, the one thing that I don't like being told is get over it. Mm. Like, I can't get over it. It's see Homer, it's a Ponakesho. This is part of me. But the things we've had different women with this being told is it's kind of scary. Called a witch. There's someone told, oh, you, you eat babies. That's why you can't have babies. I'm like, so who? That doesn't even make sense. And then sometimes you're told, um, some ladies have been told you've aborted so much, that's why you're aborted until you pull out your uterus. I mean, and, and how do you deal with the, the dating aspect of all this, you know? Right. As for me, <laughs> I am not dating. And uh, if I try to date, the first thing I make sure, in the first few days of the dating, I sit you down, I tell you, this is me. This is what I am. So it's either for the person to choose. Mm. Stay, or go. So much that comes with dating. I, I, yeah. I believe in dating, but um, I do date, but um, I always have that at the back of my mind, that yes. when I bring this to the table, chances so, are very high yes. you're going to walk away. So I'm always ready for that. I mean, and you've actually also created a support group where other women, I mean, extremely rare, but at least for the cases that you do know within Kenya, uh, what has that support group done in terms of just creating a safe space for other women with MRKH? I think you hit the nail right on the head. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a yeah. safe place. It's, it's home for us because we each have we don't live together so we each have different experiences uh we're not from the same tribe so each tribe has its own culture has its own questions and it's home it's a place where you come and if you don't want to talk you can cry just cry no one will ask you any question if you want to scream if you want to punch on something just do it so that's before i knew what support groups were you know when you're in school you learn these things you just hear support groups uh, having a group of people who will help you until you meet them and until you see the power of having a support group yeah. because you go through your worst and then you come here and you all laugh about it like it's so fun. it becomes funny mm. that people actually say such things yeah you know uh, many would be curious um, you don't have to share this you know you can live a very quiet life where no one really knows what it is you're going through mm -hmm. Why, why go public? Why share this? And, and considering the stigma attached to it. Oh, okay. Um, it is a choice to go public or not. But then again, I believe if she did not go public, if Joan did not go public, maybe I'd never known mm -hmm. uh, something called a marriage. <coughs> and I, have, I would have thought I am alone. I believe someone out there is suffering and would like to know, am I alone? Is this, a, am I bewitched? Because out there you are told something is wrong. Your mother did something to someone. That's why. Ask your mother. And you find out that you might make the people who love you your enemies. Because you don't know what is happening to you. Because to a point you ask God, God, out of the 5,000 babies born, why me? Because that's a statistic, right? Yes. Yeah. One out of every yes. 5,000. So you ask God, why me? And, and Joanne, what are some of the stories that you do get from, from the women within the group? Mm. What do they tell you? Wow. <laughs> that's, that's like, <laughs> that like, like, we can make a whole series. A whole series, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. imagine. We get so many stories. We have a lady who was thrown out by her husband and humiliated in the neighborhood. And he went telling the church group, everybody, um, we have some ladies in West Africa who are taken to a um, witch doctor because, well, they believe their caste and all that. Um, and we have the religious aspect where we have some false prophets or false pastors out there, there's so many, 
who come and tell you, oh, come, uh, I'll heal you, just bring some money, and you go, come back, still the same. Of and course, taking advantage of the situation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And we have also in the medical world where people take advantage of situations. That's even worse. It's painful to listen to those stories because you're like, really? The one place, because when you go to the medical, you're looking for help. When you go to the religious, you're also looking for help. You're looking to understand. What would you want people to know uh, beyond, you know, the factual medical aspect of your condition? What would you want them to know? Why is it important to understand and get to, to see other people's lifestyles who go through something totally different from you? One, it takes away ignorance just takes away your ignorance, just to learn. Because I believe ignorance is a choice. You choose to be ignorant. Because you choose to block the world around you. And two, it, it helps you not to be judgmental of people's choices. Some people have, everybody makes a choice. All of us want a great life. We all want to live and thrive and have an amazing story to tell. But sometimes we go through things that when we make a choice, when we have to make the decision at that point, it may not go well with the society or with the friends or with the family. Our job as human beings is to understand and cater for those choices because we all have a choice we've made in our lives that didn't go as it should have gone.